right? It, it, Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I just f first want to check: is, is this is this echoing too much? It is a bit. I'll turn it down a bit. Um, is that better? That's better. Good. Right. Okay. Well, I think if we can have the lights down a bit, please. Um, that'd be great. Right, so we're beginning with Charles II. This is a rather lovely portrait of him by a, a Dutch artist called Simon van Elst. Um, and you can see him all in the typical sort of uh, exaggerated fashion of the time with all these uh, uh, decorations on his shoes and his tassels and his robes and his... I mean, it's, it's, you, you couldn't think of much more to put on, really. Um, it's it's quite, quite amazing. And this is all very much part and parcel of the whole spirit of the era. It's a very exaggerated, very elaborate era, an era of sumptuousness, an era of luxury, and he was very much the monarch to uh, um, exemplify that in, in, in England. Um, so um, what happens there, as I mentioned yesterday, was that uh, Charles uh, II, that is, uh, after his father was beheaded in 1649, uh, was in exile partly in France, but also, more importantly, in the Netherlands. And not only was he in exile, of course, but so were his associates and followers and, and royalist um, uh, adherents. So when they come back, they bring back with them the latest ideas from the continent. Uh, because, as, as I mentioned, you know, travel is uh, obviously very, very limited in those days, and travel, and therefore style doesn't take, it takes a longer time to travel than it does now. So, what happens is that here is an example from the Netherlands. It's this, this very wonderful house in The Hague called the Maurits House. Um, and uh, it is today, of course, as I'm sure many of you have been, it's recently been reopened, and it's the most wonderful museum of the most extraordinary treasures, including the greatest uh, advert, which is the girl with the pearl earring. Uh, but the, the building is a typical example of the sophistication and the uh, knowledge here, uh, 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 exemplified by the, the architect Jakob von Kampen, the knowledge of Palladian architecture. It's balanced, it's harmonious, it's uh, elegant, it's refined, and it's this sort of influence, of course, that they bring in. Not so much the grandeur of Versailles, but more the more, the more compact influence from, from the Netherlands. And you can see this here. If you, if you look at the, 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 the Maritza, 1630s to 40s, then you can see here, 1660s, uh, the almost exact copy of the Maurits house in, in, in London. Um, it is uh, by the architect to the king. He does work, and his work still survives, in fact, at Windsor Castle, Sir Hugh May. Um, and um, you can see here that... Um, the golfers in the foreground uh, remind us that, in fact, the, the building is now the, the um, clubhouse of the Royal Blackheath Golf Course. Uh, so, uh, but really, you're meant to be admiring the architecture, not admiring their, their strips or whatever. Um, and it shows a very clear uh, adherence to the, the, the new world that's being brought in. Uh, you've, got, you've got here the, 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 the sash windows. The sash windows is a Dutch invention. Uh, you've got, again, the pilasters, the balanced pediment, uh, you have the, the dormer windows situated in the roof, um, and this is the style which obviously is the, the, the style of the period in the 1660s onwards. Now, in, if you have, as I mentioned yesterday, much more light coming into your buildings, if you have um, a, a new sense of grandeur, a sense of opulence, a sense of magnificence, uh, oak is no longer the wood of your choice, and you want to move to the era of walnut. Walnut, which is a local wood, of course, uh, it's in those days, it was a local wood in England. Um, and here, you can, uh, we're looking at a, a, one of the 
um, significant figures of this period in the range of the, the de 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 decoration of the arts. She was born Elizabeth Murray. In her own right, she was the Countess of Dysart, and she married the Duke of Lauderdale, so she's got quite a distinguished sort of pedigree. Um, and here she's painted by Sir Peter Lilly as a young girl. She became rather blousy in, in, in middle age, I'm afraid to say. I'm not showing you a portrait of her. She became rather blousy, and uh, she actually has the distinction of being, supposedly being, the mistress of both Cromwell and Charles II, which uh, um, is quite a feat, really. Um, and um, Anyway, she actually is responsible for uh, the decoration and the furnishings of a house just outside London in Richmond on the Thames, um, and it is Ham House. I don't know if any of you have been. If not, it really is a treat to go to. Um, Ham House at Richmond. It was begun in 1610 by her father, but then she, with the wealth that was brought to the marriage by the Duke of Lauderdale, she from 1673 will then completely alter and redecorate the house. And for some extraordinary reason, the, the house remains almost intact, unchanged virtually from the 1670s. Uh, the generation gen after generation of descendants seemed either to have been too mean, or too mean or too dull or too incompetent to actually alter anything. Um, and it just remains as it is to a very large extent. It's most extraordinary. In fact, it's, as you can see there in the quote, it says it, the Ham House is unique in Europe as the most complete survival of 17th, 17th century fashion and power. And he was a very powerful man, the Duke of Lauderdale. He was one of Charles II's intimate advisers. So at, at, at Ham, you see here, for instance, and what is the North Drawing Room? Now, an inventory exists. An inventory exists from 1679, so there's no dispute. And we know that these chairs, the, dolphins, the set of dolphins' chairs, uh, you can see that the arms have dolphins on them uh, at the top there, uh, right at the top left. Um, and um, these chairs were in the North Drawing Room in 1679, and they're still in the Drawing Room now in 2019. It's quite extraordinary, really. Uh, <clears throat> you can see the Solomonic columns uh, 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 spiralling, twisting around the fireplace. Uh, always a very uh, significant de decorative motif. Now, it's similarly here. The long gallery survives with its paintings as they were, uh, with their original frames. The, the frames are all similar. Uh, <clears throat> and the long gallery with its rather dark moulding, uh, rather dark panelling, rather. On the left-hand side of the gallery, uh, I beg one right-hand side, um, is, and then top left, you can see it in detail, is a, an ebony cabinet of floral marquetry. Now, yesterday I mentioned inlay, where you dig into the wood, the, the, the carcass, the, the solid wood, and place little decorative panels in, in those spaces. Floral marquetry is much more com complicated, much more artistic, and much more uh, uh, elegant. It's where you cover a surface with a jigsaw pattern of little tiny veneers, all again stained and dyed in the brightest of bright colours. Um, and those colours obviously through the years, centuries have faded. So the, the, the floral marquetry cabinet, and floral marquetry is again coming in from the Netherlands. It's, it's a Netherlandish technique. Um, and it, we are, it's attributed to a man called Gerrit Jensen. We'll see another of his pieces of furniture later on. Um, and he presumably was from the Low Countries, but we have no knowledge of his birth. Um, and he then worked as a, uh, uh, a furniture maker, as a cabinet maker, for the royal court in England. Here again, you can see in Ham House, there's a new sense of intimacy, there's a new sense of sophistication. You no longer have a great hall, there's no need for that, instead of which you have these set pieces of long galleries for your display of portraiture, you have your, you have your chamber, your state chamber, you have your withdrawing room, and here, similarly, you have uh, smaller rooms. And on the left-hand side, you can see in, in Ham House, again, the Queen's Closet. Um, and it means, it doesn't mean a loo, it means a simply a small room for intimate conversations, for privacy, perhaps to read, to read a book, perhaps to write a letter, or whatever. And in this instance, 
because it was designed for the use of the Queen, who would, who, in case she ever came there, but she never did. And you can see here this, with the, the uh, far surround um, and the, the floor decoration, which is made of scagliola. Scagliola is marble uh, paste. It's marble chips ground down, marble paste, which is then painted. It's a sort of poor man's uh, um, pietra dura, a poor man's inlay of, of uh, coloured stones. Um, <clears throat> and it survives, of course, because it's, pl- it, it's, it's marble and it survived through the centuries. Similarly to the, to the Noel settee that we saw yesterday, uh, this is a sleeping chair in the, in, in the inventory, where obviously you can adjust the back to have a really good snooze after a, a, a lunch or whatever. Um, and again, it's the original upholstery, and the original colours are the, still very evident. It's quite extraordinary to think that this chair dates from the 1670s uh, with its original upholstery. Um, and here again, you can see two examples of what are called a scriptor, because only now, and now being the 1660s, 1670s, only now with the restoration, is, is, is there a generation of people who are educated enough, who are sophisticated enough to write letters to each other. So prior to that, in the Elizabethan world, you may, may have had your scribe, you may have had your secretary or whatever, but now you want the intimacy of your little rooms where you could write, private, you could write in private uh, letters to your friends and so on. And the, so new are these, they, they don't call them a writing desk or a writing table or a bureau bookcase or bureau or whatever, they call them the Latin word, which is the scriptor. Um, and the, these two, as you see, on the, on my, on the, the left-hand side, it's, it's Kingwood veneer uh, and silver mounts. Silver mounts are reminding us that these are very special uh, items of furniture. Um, and then on the, the right-hand side, a walnut, which is inlaid, the little lines inlaid with e- ebony and elm. Again, with silver mounts. So it's a new world developing. It's a new world of sophistication. It's a new world of culture. Uh, it's a new world of uh, literacy. And you can, so we'll see that again in a moment in the bookcase. Um, so here again, you're looking at uh, one of the ladies of the court. It was a very uh, sort of profligate, very uh, sexually orientated court of Charles II. And she is Di- Count- Diana Kirk, the Countess of Oxford. And she's so showing a great deal more of her wares than she needs to do, really. Um, but um, <clears throat> what you must concentrate on uh, is, is the costume. Um, the costume is... Um, uh, again, a reminder of this sense of colour, sense of luxury, sense of sumptuousness, this enormous, wonderful, uh, shimmering fabric which she, which she wears, um, is very much part and parcel of the whole ethos of this grand three-dimensional uh, form of design and, and, and living, basically, as well. Sadly, this was a portrait which, which hung in an English country house, privately owned, but now has made its way across the, across the pond to America, and it's in Yale. Um, and luxury as well, you see here. Again, don't forget that Charles II was the cousin of Louis XIV, and Louis XIV furnished, his, furnished the rooms of Versailles, or furnished the long gallery, the, the Galerie des Glaces in Versailles, with solid silver furniture. This is not solid silver. It's, fur, it's uh, silver um, sheets, uh, which have been embossed and, and decorated and ornamented, but cover, they cover a, a solid wooden base, probably oak base. Uh, but it's a set of furniture given to Charles II by the um, uh, City of London, and uh, you can, it still remains in Windsor today. Uh, you can see a detail of the table on, on the, uh, the right-hand side. Uh, the table, the two candle stands, the big mirror. And you can find other examples, but not many, of silver furniture in, in, in England. Um, it was perhaps just a step too far for most people, um, but step, not, not because of the lack of money, but of course I think it was just a little too exaggerated, a little too OTT. But here in, in Windsor, of course, it works very well. Um, <clears throat> now, silverware always is ahead of the time, and this is a silver porringer. And it's using the new technique to take of embossing, where you create a three dimension from behind the, the, the sheet of well, behind the silverware, by the sheet of silver, you actually push out 
the decoration. And what's so extraordinary is that here you can see it's a sort of fox-like creature there. And then, most extraordinary, that seems to be Donald Trump. Can you see? <laughs> Can you see? It's got, it's got his hairdo and he's a little, got his little piggy eyes. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it pops up everywhere, the dreadful man. It's quite extraordinary. Um, but anyway, um, this is a reminder again that the, the, the use of embossing is again a very new three-dimensional form of decoration. Uh, you don't engrave it, you, 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 now you create this three-dimensional form, which is what is very much part and parcel of the era. And, and this is a porringer dated, obviously, through the silver, silver from the Hellmarks, 1660 to 61. Um, and here, an example of this three-dimensional um, decoration in a house in, called, in Derbyshire called Sudbury. And it's got rather an interesting background, this house, because it was built by a man called George Vernon, and it is the best example of how slowly style and fashion moved. The court in London, or in, 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 in any capital city, would obviously be that the, the air area of uh, um, new inventions and new ideas, but it would take a long time to filter out. Because here in the 1660s, 1670s, George Vernon is building a new house for himself. And actually what he's doing is building a very old-fashioned house. Because the crisscross patterning, the herringbone patterning of the brickwork is really Tudor. Um, similarly, that frontispiece has died out now. We've seen it used before, yesterday, but it's now out of fashion. Now, you, now you've, uh, we saw that facade of the golf club in, in Blackheath, where you have the, the columns and the pediment. You don't have, a, you don't have this frontispiece anymore. And so Mr. Vernon went to London and suddenly realised that he was terribly out of fashion. So he rushes back home and says, stop, 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 must, must have the native style. So he does actually add the dormer windows uh, in, in, in the roof. Uh, but what he does do is, in making a sort of virtue out of necessity, he, he imports from London the most important plasterers. And I'll only show you one example, but they're called Bradbury and Pettifer. And these two men obviously were expert plasterers. And here, you can see here in the staircase, this extraordinary ceiling, um, which is all created. Basically, what you do is, as you're making the ceiling, you, let, you, you suspend through the, the, the plaster work these little wires. And onto the wires, you then mold the swags, uh, and the various forms of de uh, floral decoration and so on and so forth. There's another example in the Long Gallery as well. It's quite extraordinarily beautiful and, and obviously an, a tremendous dust trap, but that's another story. But um, it is a, an amazing piece of, of decoration. Now, in Sudbury, as part of the original furnishings, uh, is the chair on the right-hand side. And this again shows this new preoccupation with the East. Because whereas previously we saw, yesterday we had a back stool which had, which had turkey work, sort of embroidered decoration. Um, nowadays, in, now in, in the 1670s, you are importing rattan uh, from the East, from the Malaysian Peninsula, and you are therefore creating a caned seat and a caning in the back. And it becomes the rage, because obviously this is modern, this is new, this is exciting, this is eastern, this is exotic, um, and all pieces of furniture in the 1660s, 1670s, all chairs, will, be, uh, will invariably have caning or, or, uh, in, in the uh, uh, decoration. It dies out eventually. Caning, as, as we know, is, is very sensible because it's not uh, sort of, uh, you, can, you can easily clean it, it's more hygienic, but of course it breaks very easily too. So it's not ideal. Um, anyway, that, there's the, that's the, the new example of the new world. Now you can see the new world coming in, you know, the new era, the new, new sense of decoration. Um, and of course the East is, is predominant. Now the stand on the left is very important. It's in ham, it's in the inventory, uh, it therefore has been in hand since the 1670s. Now, the actual cabinet, not the stand, the cabinet itself uh, is probably made in the East with Western mounts. These mounts 
obviously are not Eastern, but they are, uh, they are probably sent by the East India Company, um, whether it be the Dutch or the English, we don't know, uh, but it's, they were sent to the, the agents in Japan. This cabinet is Japanese. How can you tell Japanese lacquer from Chinese lacquer? It's very, very, very simple, because Japanese lacquer actually is much more sophisticated, and what is, occurs in Japanese lacquer is they build a three-dimensional uh, uh, picture. You can probably make it out there. It, it looks three-dimensional. It actually is raised up. It's, a, it's raised decoration. So it gives a three-dimensional form. It's a bit more difficult to, much more difficult to create. And it's all usually black with gold, or sometimes you could have red or green, but uh, it's usually black, black lacquer. Um, Chinese lacquer is flat. Chinese lacquer, you can run your hand across it, and you don't, there's, no, there's no raised decoration. Um, now, the, the fashion for Chinese, for lacquer, the fashion for everything oriental is, is, is uh, uh, obsessional. Uh, it's, it's unending. And eventually, by the 1680s, a team of men called Stalker and Parker, a pair of men, Stalker and Parker, publish a book on how you can actually create a lacquer yourself. Um, it's, and European lacquer is called Japaning, Japaned. You, if a piece is Japaned, it doesn't mean it comes from Japan, it means it's covered with European decoration. And the stand, stand on the, 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 the cabinet on the left, um, on the right rather, the cabinet on the right um, is, of, is English Japaning. It was obviously not as easy as it sounds, but at least it shows that there was this, such interest in it that even the, the, this, this, uh, uh, for, this book was published to, to show people how to do it. Uh, in addition, you see the cabinet on the right with these silver, silver legs, silver base, silver stand, and the uh, decoration above, the pediment above, and what sure, because you can see the dates are different. Uh, the, this cabinet uh, is, is, is actually lacquer from the 1650s, but the stand is a little later. This very strange stand here. Uh, these funny figures, the very little children who develop into elephant tusks. Why and how that was, we don't know. I mean, obviously, um, it comes from a pattern book, and this, obviously, the, 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 the craftsman thought this was a useful thing to do, and perhaps the Duchess of Lauderdale, because it comes from Ham. Perhaps she thought it was a lovely work, too. However, I'm talking about the stand on the right-hand side, where everything you see is going upwards. There's this sense of verticality as you get towards the 1690s, 1700s. Every, everyone, we try and make ourselves taller, but men have huge wigs. Women have sort of hairdos and, and uh, hats that, that stick up in, in, in the air. So, and you'll see that in a moment. So there you see this movement towards verticality and also the difference between oriental lacquer and English, or in this instance, English Japaning. It could also be French or German Japaning as well. Um, again here, this amazing bed. Um, it's a bed made for a king. Charles uh, II will die in um, 1685. He, he dies without heir although he was married to a Portuguese princess and he had many, many, when he dies, with, he leaves men, many progeny behind, might I say, but they're none of them, are, uh, they're all illegitimate. Um, and so when Charles II dies, his brother, James II, uh, mounts the throne. Um, and James II's reign is very, very short because James II was intent upon reintroducing uh, Catholicism into Britain, and this precipitates his demise, and at the glorious revolution, as it's called, in 1688, he flees, flees to the continent. Um, so this bed was actually made in the year that he left, he fled the, uh, England. Um, the bed is made by Thomas Roberts, who's the royal um, uh, upholsterer, and um, you can see there, it's this huge, huge bed, towering above you, um, with this great canopy. And the, the curtains, they're always original. The curtains, the stools, the chairs, they all survive intact. These are in Knoll, in, in, in Kent, we saw yesterday. And why would a king's bed be necessarily in Knoll? And the reason is that in the, in the, it was a tradition at court that you, as an aristocrat, 
would attend the king, who would have an posi official position for the king, who would be the, um, I don't know, the holder of the sword or the uh, whatever, the, whatever, whatever you did at court, whatever you did with the, in the king's presence. Um, and these courtiers, when the king dies, in this instance when the king flees, but when the king no longer is ruling, when the king ceases to be the king, uh, then um, you as a courtier have the right to acquire his furniture. And so there are lots of instances of this in, in various country houses across, across England uh, where this furniture was acquired. Obviously, one of the Sackville family was at court at the time. He was a, a member of the entourage to, uh, attending on the king, and uh, he acquired this bed and its, its, uh, its chairs, its stools and chairs. Um, so when James II is deposed, uh, his daughter... Uh, uh, deposes him actually her, his daughter and his son-in-law depose him and they become William and Mary Dutch William William, William of Orange William the third, he becomes William III of England uh, with his wife Mary Mary II they rule jointly until Mary dies Mary dies in 1694 uh, William will continue to live until 1702 but they are very cultured couple, and Queen Mary II was a very, very sophisticated lady, and she was particularly interested and passionate about blue and white porcelain. Blue and white porcelain from the East, uh, or Delftware from the Netherlands. And you see this in her house, which again is one of these extraordinary um, homes that survive almost intact. It's a house north of Bath, it's not too far away from Bath, but it's technically called South Gloucestershire, um, and it's called Durham Park. Durham Park, uh, 1690 to 1702, owned by the National Trust again today. Um, and the original owner was a man called Blaithwaite, and Blaithwaite was um, a courtier to William, the, he was at the court of William and Mary. Pushing the wrong thing. Um, there we are. Um, now, in Durham is one of, a, one of a pair of bookcases. The other, its, it's twin, is actually in the Victoria and Albert Museum now. This is a bookcase in Durham, and it's one of a pair, very similar to the bookcases made for Samuel Pepys. Samuel Pepys, the famous diarist, in fact, had 12 bookcases made for his, to contain his books and his diaries, his writings. The, the 12 bookcases owned by Samuel Pepys are now in Magdalen College, Cambridge. Um, and here is a, an exact replica. Now, the interest is that Samuel Pepys's bookcases, and this is a copy, this is a version, and these, these are the first examples of any piece of furniture designed specifically to contain books. Because, again, prior to that, particularly in the Tudor era, uh, a book was a very, very rare uh, 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 aspect of your, of your life. It's only really much later into the, this period of the 1670s, 1680s, particularly in the 18th, in the 18th century, that uh, book, books become part of your life. And here, therefore, this is a very rare example, again, of the new spirit of intellectual uh, advancement that is occurring and therefore influences the country house, the influences these houses. And eventually, of course, in the 18th century, you'll have libraries, you'll have specifically rooms specifically built for your books and for study. So here at Durham, you see the earliest example of a bookcase in England. Oops, sorry. That's, I didn't went too fast. Back one. In fact, I go back two, I think. Yes, there we are. Then this is one of the rooms in Durham. It's called the Diogenes Room. It's, it's the, the tapestry, and it's one of a pair that uh, shows stories uh, of the life or times of Diogenes. Uh, but it's one of these, it's dark panelling, stained pine to make it look like uh, a, a more expensive wood. Um, and then. Um, the chairs are original to the house, as are particularly, most importantly, these uh, tulip vases. And there's, there's another vase in, in the um, fireplace. Uh, <clears throat> and you can see here uh, the, one of the chairs. It's been re-upholstered. This is not the original upholstery. But you can see here it's a very elegant carved beech walnut chair with a beech frame. 
Um, but more importantly is the Dutch Delftware tulip vase. These extraordinary items, they're tour de force, they're incredibly uh, uh, sophisticated in their manufacture and in their paintwork. It shows again the difference between uh, the sophistication of, of pottery uh, and decoration of pottery in, in, the, in, in the Netherlands compared to England. It's this, and of course you place the flowers in the little holes, in the little spouts. Um, and it's, it's called tulips because you, you're meant to put tulips in, but you, there's no necessi necessity to use them, only, to use only tulips. Um, and here again, you can see another vase, which is also from Durham, um, which, in fact, it has, a, has a, 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 the maker's mark on it, a man, A.K. for Adrianus Cox, and he was one of the leading pottery uh, factories in, in, in Delft at the time. So these are very good examples, and there is in the V&A another example, more in that sort of pyramidal shape, um, <coughs> that ob obelisk, obelisk type shape, uh, that is in the V&A, which was specifically made, acquired by Queen, Queen Mary II. She was passionate about this, passionate about not only importing porcelain from the East, but also uh, support, supporting the Delft um, the pottery factories. And here you can see the difference. This is an English Delftware. Um, and I mean, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's, it's pretty amusing. I mean, you, it's quite large, it's, it's a big sort of charger. But do look, Queen Mary's wearing her slippers. Um, and she's got a very, very wobbly crown, and her, her wig's just about to fall off. I mean, it's, 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 I mean, it's very badly painted. It's, it's so delightfully naive, it's all, almost, you know, it's, it's very much a collector's item. And this plate, by the way, if it was sold on the open market today, would, would command an enormous amount of money. But in, in the, at the time, you can see how different it is, that there, there's a enormous naivety. It's called Blue Dash. These, these, this is typical of English Delftware. That, that you have this blue dash, this, this sort of line going round the, the edge of, of the plate, a blue dash, made in, made in uh, London or Bristol. And here it's a reminder in this instance because it's a very sophisticated little cabinet, it's a dwarf cabinet, it's only about two feet high, uh, <clears throat> and it's made for William III, and it's remained in the royal collection from the time he acquired it, until today, it remains in the Royal Collection. Um, and it's made again probably by Gerrit Jensen. Um, it's attributed to him. Now, it's made, as you see, of, of wood, into which has been placed in, in a sort of inlaid manner the metalwork, metal veneers. And of course, this is a technique which is uh, associated with the French, the great French furniture maker, André Charles Boulle, Boulle, B O U L L E. <clears throat> but it does remind us that ideas are coming directly from the French court into England now with the flood of Huguenot craftsmen fleeing persecution in France. Uh, as we know from, from, from uh, our history, uh, the, the, the Huguenots keep coming to, to, to Franchuk, that um, the Huguenots are uh, expelled from France unless they absorb, unless they uh, became uh, converted to Catholicism, and they would suffer enormous indignities and enormous persecution. Um, from 1685, the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, as it's called, the revocation of the uh, freedom that, uh, of religion in France, was, the freedom of France was revoked by Louis XIV in 1685. And this precipitated the flight of many craftsmen most of the artisan craft, most of the artisan class were Protestant, and therefore Louis XIV did himself the most amazing injury by A, expelling these craftsmen, and B, then exporting the talent that he had to the, his rival nations, such as Britain or the Netherlands. So we benefit, the Northern Territories benefit. Um, and this is a good example. The, 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 under uh, Herrick Jensen here is copying uh, the French idea of using metal uh, on your decoration as a furniture decoration. And you see this here in, in silverware. All the great silversmiths of the late 17th, early, 19, early 18th century, of the late 1690s, 1700s, all the great silversmiths are Huguenots. 
Uh, this is Philip Rolos. Uh, we know all, a lot about them, of course, because although they met enormous discrimination when they came to London, obviously, or made principally London, when they came to London, they, they were very much discriminated against uh, by the locals because the locals fared for their well, well-being, which, of course, was quite true because these men were so much more talented. And Philip Rolos is one of these men who, for this, in, in this instance, is making a silver wine cistern for the second Earl of Warrington. The wine cistern is the size of a baby's bath. It's absolutely absolutely enormous. Um, with these two, with the, the two handles are boars. Obviously, the boar is um, part of the uh, coat of arms of the, of the Warrington family. This silverware still survives in the house for which it was made, which is a house outside Manchester called Dunham Massey, but owned by the National Trust. So the Huguenot influence is absolutely vital and absolutely central to the... <coughs> era we're discussing. And one of the great names, because other than the silversmiths, we don't have many other names um, associated with, with these, this influx of talent. What happened generally was they fled France, they fled into the Netherlands, and then particularly when William III, who was Dutch, as I mentioned, when William III becomes King of England, they follow him into England. So it goes to France, through the Low Countries and into England. And this is what happened with Daniel Murrow. Daniel Murrow was uh, a designer, an architect, um, and uh, here he's designing a chimney, a, a, a decoration for a chimney, with, which is lacquer, the lacquer would have been here, and then using up above, the, uh, on the uh, overmantel, um, you would have all that porcelain or pottery uh, uh, placed. Possibly the design was made for Queen Mary herself, and it's in the V&A. Now, Daniel Murrow is associated, possibly, he's possibly the architect of the facade here of Petworth House. <clears throat> and Petworth in West Sussex um, has this very grand, uh, but slightly boring facade. And the, why I say that is that it is quite clearly influenced by Versailles. It almost can be st stated as being the sort of British version of Versailles. Uh, because it has, it's almost exactly the same. Versailles, you know, with all those huge blocks that Versailles is uh, created of, uh, it, are boring. I mean, they're they just, uh, just a, they're there for their shape, their vast magnificence and, and uh, sort of overwhelming uh, size. And this is the same here at Petworth, <coughs> the West Facade, which is sophisticated, but it is, uh, lacks a, a sort of extra flourish in a way. But... Uh, um, <coughs> Inside, it's a very different kettle of fish. Here, the entrance hall, the marble hall of, of Petworth is a fine example of the very sophisticated uh, um, use of plasterwork, use of marbles uh, that you find here. Uh, the broken uh, pediment above, above the fireplace, um, <coughs> the, the sort of frieze uh, running around the, 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 the cornice. Um, all that is of a very, very, very high standard. Again, one must says, therefore assume here in Petworth with, were the um, influences coming out of the continent from France. Now, Petworth is particularly famous um, for, for, well, for many things, actually, but uh, it's here it's famous for its Brindling Gibbons room. All this extraordinary carving in lime wood. Lime wood is a very soft wood, lime wood or the linden tree. Lime wood, uh, which uh, is all here, the surrounds of Henry VIII and all the surrounds of the, the paintings. Uh, Grinning Gibbons, who you can see here in a portrait. I keep on pushing the wrong thing. There we are. Um, here, there's Grinning Gibbons. This is a version. The original portrait uh, is in the, in the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. This is in the Portrait Gallery in London, but it is a copy of the version in uh, Russia. Grinning Gibbons was born in the Netherlands, but he was born of English stock and returns to England uh, then to become this extraordinary exponent of a craft that he is supreme at. Uh, when you think that this carving here um, was once one piece of wood, it's quite, quite amazing, really. When you think of the, the strings of the violin, um, 
and the, the, the lace decoration below. It, it's a, a, a tour de force which almost defies description. It, it's just amazingly co competent. And again, it's very much part of the whole spirit of the time. It's three-dimensional, it's elaborate, it's ornamental, it's grand, it's opulent. It has all the aspects of the Baroque. Because England doesn't really have a Baroque a sense in, in, in its architecture, because we're, we're, we're too sort of conform, conservative, really. But they, um, they, in the decoration of houses and the decoration of, owner, uh, of, of, of furniture and so on, you see a far greater sense of the Baroque filtering through. <clears throat> and here are the Green and Gibbons carving from, from Petworth. Two chairs here. Uh, you can see, as, as I mentioned, <coughs> furniture. <coughs> Decoration, buildings, all get taller and taller and taller. We try and get, uh, make ourselves taller and taller. Even men and women wear very high heel shoes so they can sort of get taller. <clears throat> and here you can see the movement from the, the left hand side, a walnut and caned chair, um, which was in Montacute House. We saw Montacute yesterday. Uh, it's a high back chair. They're both high back chairs. And then in the VA, you can see a slight variation. You've moved away, you've moved back to, 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 to um, upholstery by the 1690s, 1700s, and instead of uh, uh, caning the, the back, I think I said, I, I, I really like that chair on the right in the VA. It's, it's a supreme example of sort of the late year, last years of the 1600s, uh, with that sort of little spindly back, with the spindles in, in the back. Painted beach. Black, of course, is the more is the favoured colour. And then these dolls. These are called Lord and Lady Clapham. <clears throat> we don't know what they were called originally, but they, they were in a house in Clapham. That's why they're called Lord and Lady Clapham. They're in the v &A. <clears throat> That's 56 centimetres or 22 inches, so they're quite big. And they're almost perfect. So the assumption is that they couldn't have been used by the children, because children would have pulled them apart. And, uh, <clears throat> but they must have been a sort of family um, who appreciated dolls for some reason, and it was the adults who, who would have played with them, or used them, or shown them off. Uh, anyway, they survive with this extraordinary uh, effect, because they're wearing the clothes of the 1690s, 1700. And they, it's a perfect, perfect, um, complete miniature example of the fashion of the time. Um, and you can see here, I get, I, we'll have a close-up. <clears throat> she has this extraordinary headdress um, with a sort of wild cap. Um, her gown is a mant it's, it's called a mantua, which is, it sort of flows from the shoulders. It, it, you, don't have a you don't have a waist. Uh, um, you don't, you don't ex emphasize your waist. And it's a sort of flowing gown, the mantua, which is a very, very popular gown, which goes through many, many decades. Um, and then her stiff corset that she's wearing in, in, in the front. Um, so these two little dolls are actually, well, not so little. These two dolls are um, very much an example um, and a lasting example of uh, um, the period we're discussing um, in the V&A. And this is another extraordinary example of what's called the Stoke Edith Hanging. Stoke Edith was a country house. Stoke Edith today, tragically, uh, is just an absolute derelict ruin. Um, it's sort of really the most extraordinary sort of decline. But when you think that this is embroidery and it is the hanging, and you can see where it hung originally uh, in the bedroom up at the top left, you get an idea of how big it was from the bed. Um, and it's actually seven meters across, which is 23 feet across. And it's over three meters high, which is 11 feet. In, 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 uh, where, and this was all embroidered. And the tradition, apparently, in, in the Stoke Edith household was it was embroidered by the ladies of the time. 
but the VNA, which now owns it, uh, um, seem to, I think, that they feel that it must have been done by professional needleworkers. Uh, nevertheless, it's, it's quite incredible. So when you're actually slaving away over that embroidered cushion you're thinking of doing tomorrow, uh, think, of, think of the Stoke Edith hanging, which is seven metres long, um, and it might sort of put things into perspective a little more. Um, but it's, it's of a formal garden. Whether it's the garden of Stoke Edith or not, we don't know. Um, but it's obviously a sort of Anglo-Dutch style garden. It's sort of, or Franco-Anglo-Dutch. It's a sort of a bit of France, a bit of Dutch, a bit of England thrown in, but more, more, more the continent, because it's a formal garden. It's before, before um, uh, pit capability round et al. and the change of direction in the, in the 18th century, um, when the late English landscape becomes predominant. So the Stoke Edith hanging is a, a most fascinating piece of uh, display. There are two of them, <coughs> and in the V&A they, they alternate displaying which, whichever one it is, because obviously you, if you, you mustn't expose hangings to, to light for too long. <coughs> Interestingly, um, I've been rather rude about English pottery, uh, but I, as I say, the, the naivety of it actually sometimes this has a charm very much of its own. <clears throat> but in the case of glassware, England suddenly uh, overtakes the rest. Obviously, originally, in the Elizabethan world, in the world of the Jacobean kings, uh, the Stuart monarchy, James I, Charles I, and so on, um, you would have had craftsmen working in London, principally, uh, but they would have been from Venice. And then suddenly onto the scene, in this period, 1670s onwards, comes a man called George Ravenscroft. And George Ravenscroft is English, and he decides to use lead in his glass, rather than soda. And it's much stronger um, and originally, you can see on the left-hand side, a Ravenscroft rummer, 16, approximately 1677. It's lead glass, it's mould blown. You blow it into a mould. Ribs and applied raspberry prunts. Raspberry prunts are these sort of decorations of the, on the stem. <clears throat> so that is um, an early one. And Originally, because of the, the, he, the, obviously he experimented through the, the years, and originally the, the, the most of his early early glass um, is then becomes debased, becomes this cloudy colour uh, as opposed to a clear colour because of the, the use he, he, he omits to use alkali in, in, in his uh, formula. Then in the middle glass, you can see about 85, so it's about. It's ten years later than the left-hand glass. In the middle glass, it's lead again, it's mould-blown, um, and it's, you've, got the, you've got this rather strange stem, uh, which is called a propeller um, stem. And it looks very fragile still. It's, still is, it's sort of tentative. And then by the time you get to 1700, on the right-hand side, you can see a, a, a perfect example of where he's perfected not only the, the re recipe to make the glass, but he's also perfected the fact that it's a stubby, solid, bulbous uh, stem. And then, most importantly, you may make it out. What you do, I don't know how you do it, but when you think about it, he, when, he, when he creates the, the, the base, when he creates the foot, they then fold the foot inwards at the last minute to create an extra layer which prevents, theoretically, it prevents the glass being cracked, being, being, being broken. Um, and it's, so you see this development over about 30 years, no less than that, probably about 50, uh, 25 years, <clears throat> from the early attempts by Ravenscroft, George Ravenscroft, and a lot of his glass, by the way, is, is identifiable <clears throat> uh, because he actually uses a little mark of, of a raven, of a raven on his, uh, on his glass. Um, so suddenly, from coming from nowhere, he overtakes 
the continent because however attractive and however elegant uh, a Venetian glass is, it's very, very, very fragile. Whereas, of course, lead glass is much, much more serviceable and much more practical and actually very elegant as well. <coughs> And then, of course, in the next, next, next century, there will be far more uh, developments. But here, there are a sort of English invention for, of some very great significance. <clears throat> and finally, we get to Queen Anne. Uh, Queen Anne is a sad soul. Um, she's the last of the Stuart dynasty. Uh, the Stuarts begin with James I. Then you have Charles I, Charles II, James II, Queen Mary II, Anne. And, and Anne is the last of them, and I'm afraid she's the sort of, to be, to be perfectly blunt, the runt of the litter, really. Uh, but um, <clears throat> she, she, her, she's the daughter of James II, and although her sister, Queen Mary II, was such a talented, sophisticated lady, um, Queen, Mary, Queen Anne is not. And I, interestingly, I don't know if you've read about it yet, there's this film that's about to win all sorts of awards and Oscars and things, which is called The Favourite. And it's about Queen Anne and her relationship with her ladies-in-waiting. <clears throat> but um, I'm not sure if it's, if it's going to be a bit salacious, I think. But um, it'll be quite interesting to see. But she was a sad woman... Um, in many, many, many ways, because she desperately needed an heir, and she produced ch child after child after child which, who died in, in, at birth or shortly afterwards. In, in nothing, there was no progeny at all. She was married to the Prince of Denmark, George of Denmark. Um, <clears throat> but what is so interesting is that for a very sort of, sort of blousy woman uh, of no great uh, attributes at all, um, she gives her name to the most wonderful style of furnishings and architecture. And here is a Queen Anne house. I mean, it's, it's completely Queen Anne. It's built just at, during her reign. She, she, she reigns from 1702 to 1714. Um, <clears throat> and, this is Anthony House, spelt without an H. Anthony House in Cornwall. The families still live in it, but it's now uh, owned by the National Trust. Um, and you can see just a detail of the interior uh, on the right, bottom right. Um, it's got this beautiful balance, this harmony, this elegance, this understated refinement, which is also typically, typically English. Um, and here you can see two examples of Queen Anne furniture. The chest on a stand on the left and the walnut chair on the right. Both pieces of furniture have cabrio legs. And this is the hugely new, exciting development in furniture by about 1690, 1700, where you begin to find, and this is the, the left hand one shows the rather tentative approach of the, the animal leg. The cabrio leg, C A B R I O L E, um, and the cabrio comes from the word capra, which of course is a goat, and so it's, it's a, the animal leg, which ends in this instance in a hoof, but there it's beginning to become more, of, it's a bit of a turned up hoof there, but it's beginning to eventually develop into the claw and ball. <clears throat> but um, the cabrio, which is in fact, technically much stronger than a straight piece of wood and anyway has a greater elegance and refinement and uh, it is created as I say just at the turn of the century in, in, as we move from the 1600s to the 1700s. Interestingly Clandon and the Dutch chair comes from Clandon. Clandon uh, had a suffered if you probably remember cast your mind back there was a a cataclysmic fire where virtually 90% of all its treasures were burnt in a fire, uh, electrical fault, they think. Um, it, was, it was about oh, eight, eight years ago, maybe, seven or eight years ago. Um, and this chair actually survived the fire. Um, it, it, uh, this, this and its set, uh, but most of, the, most of the items are lost. And here, as usual, silverware showing... The